to demask. I feel I feel better when I'm demasked. Hallelujah. All right, let's. I appreciate your patience bearing with me as I try to get set. I'm a little taller. There we go. What are you saying, Pastor? Right. Nothing. <laughs> I got more more cuts and knocks on my head than you do. <laughs> I get a lot of branches. Mike's not on. Yeah, Mike's not on. But he's still a good guy when he's on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Where is that button? About the set, uh, center, of press and hold. Yeah. The green light? Yep. Green light. There you go. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all from this position here. Uh, glad to glad to be here. Uh, God is good. All the time. All the time. I'm going to give you one more try at that. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. All right. You guys know about that. Good deal. All right, as you know, my name's Roger Anderson. That's my wife, Jennifer, my three, my three sons. Doo -doo -doo -doo. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be back here to bring the message uh, of God to you today. And I'm truly thankful, and I'd like to start, open us up with prayer. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. Your word is true. Your word is pure, Lord. It's a, a lamp for my feet and a light for our paths. Help us to get into your word, Lord. Let your seed of the word plant in our hearts. And may our hearts be good soil that produces a crop. 40, 60, 100 fold, Lord. And let your word not return void in this. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. What a year. 2020. That's like a four-letter word if it wasn't numbers. I mean, 2020 has been bad. <laughs> um, I won't go into all the details. We know it. You guys are sitting there with masks on in church, social distancing when we should be socially close to each other. But I went through, I mean, I went through a hard year last year. I've been through, my wife and I have been through a hard several few years. Uh, I was laid off by Symantec Corporation in 2016, got injured, had health issues, went back to school, went and taught school. Um, but last year was pretty, last year was acute, acutely bad. And I don't mean cute, like, hey, that's cute. <laughs> it was extremely difficult. We were going all going through trials, but we had the lockdown. We had uh, we had the fires. I broke my foot, had to have surgery. And then what, what was it, a week after that? We were evacuated from our house or something like that. Uh, and they put a boot on me so that my, uh, after surgeries, instead of a cast, which I was thankful for, casts are terrible at them. And then I got a blood clot because the boot constricted the, uh, the blood flow. So I got, a, it's a venal blood clot, so it's not a, a ar arterial. So they gave me medicine for it. And then just one thing after the other, last year was bad. Um, it was an extended trial. But enough about me, we've all gone through 2020. Um, Jesus nailed it when he said in John 16, 33, I got this right. Oh, I have to turn this on, don't I? There we go. And just how long do you hold this thing? No, on the side, there's a slider on it. Oh, that's right. Slide it till you see green. Now if that's I, how I used to be a computer. Now if I push, push, the, push the top line, see if you have a light. There you go. Hey. And then you have a right turn, Ooh. left turn, click. I have a little pointer. So there's a pointer. All right. In this world, in this world, you will have all sorts of fun and nothing bad's going to happen. Did Jesus say that? No. What did he say? Say it with me. Yeah. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. That's our hope. That's, that's where we can really take heart. Jesus overcame this world. And uh, we can take heart in that. We can be partakers in that. We're part of the body of Christ. 
we can overcome because he overcame. And Jesus also said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Get that. We instinctively want to keep our lives. We instinctively want to chase after things instead of putting God first. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? That's Luke 9, 23 through 25. Now that's the key to enduring suffering is staying near the Lord and remembering to let your life go and let the Lord take over. Because God will take your life and God will make something beautiful out of it in its time. Basically, Jesus said suffering is often assigned to us except for when we suffer for our disobedience. How many have suffered for their own disobedience to God? Yeah, probably every hand should be up there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We've all suffered, you know. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we have a sin nature in us that naturally wants to do wrong. And we suffer for it. Unfortunately, many Christians are suffering due to their disobedience to God. Suffering obediently, the concept of suffering obediently, seems to be a Christian doctrine that's fallen out of favor with many these days. But it's important to know God hasn't changed. God's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Tomorrow, forever, yeah. Ionios in the Greek, forever. Um, today you can't, Today you can find many Christians who would argue that the Word of God and the need for prayer don't really apply to them. That you really don't need to live a moral, moral Christian life or that you can even cut out pieces of Scripture that you don't like. We had a founding father, I think it was uh, Jefferson, who wanted to cut the, he cut the Bible up for pieces he didn't like. I think it was Jefferson. Don't quote me. But I found that amazing. Um... Many simply ignore huge swaths of the Word of God because they really don't like what it was telling them. Jonah 1.1 1, 1. The Word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. What would Jonah do? He said, God said, go east to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. The Assyrians were wicked, horrible people. They just destroyed Damascus, which was uh, Syria, and they were coming for the northern kingdom of Israel. Jonah knew this. Jonah knew God's word. Jonah believed that the judgment would come. But now God's showing mercy to the Ninevites. Jonah, Jonah didn't want to do this, so Jonah, instead of going east, he went west. Instead of going to Nineveh, he went to Tarshish. Wherever that is. They, they, they don't know exactly where the Tarshish he, he went to is. It could be different than the one that Saul was from in the New Testament. It could even be as far away as Spain. But the truth, I guess as Henry, one of our old managers used to say, the long and the short of it is he didn't do what God wanted to do. So he went down to Joppa, got on a boat, started sailing the other direction. He didn't want to do what God wanted him to do. And guess what happens when you're disobedient to God's word? A storm arose for him. I mean, it was a bad one. And even the, the hardened sailors were like, whoa, we, you know, we live in the Mediterranean. There's storms all the time, but we're going to die. And they... And as Jonah was sleeping, as Jonah was ignoring it, ignoring the storm, as a believer, these guys, these sailors were like, we, we need to find out who's the cause of this, and now we're going to die. They cast lots, they rolled dice, they did whatever. It randomly, randomly fell on Jonah. <laughs> and so they, they had questions for Jonah. <laughs> Got some explaining to do. Who are you? Where are you from? 
where are you going? And, and Jonah basically said, I'm a prophet of the, of the God of heaven and earth. See, back then, people believed that there was a God of the ocean. The God of the ocean was Dagon to these people. He was supposed to be the father of Baal. And they believed he was in charge of the sea. Then there was the God of the sky. Could have been Enki. Could have been various different gods. There was a God of the mountains. There was, there was a God for every occasion. You know, it was, it was like uh, getting Hallmark cards. You know, there's a, there's a God for every occasion, they believed. But basically, when you say he's the God of the, the ocean and the sky, he's from here to there. He's that God who controls everything. That scared them. And they said, how are we going to fix this? And Jonah said, throw me overboard. I'm the cause. I'd rather die than go and preach to the Ninevites, is what he was saying. I know better than God. I don't want God's will to happen in my life or for those Ninevites. And so they didn't want to do it. They tried to row to shore. They finally said, Lord, God of heaven and earth, please don't hold this, this man's life against us and toss him overboard. Well, God... Whoops. I, I was going to have a picture of Jonah and the whale, but we can all imagine that. Whale, great fish, whatever. Doesn't matter the, the avenue. The, the point is, is Jonah went inside of this big sea creature. Let's say it was a great fish, because that's what Jonah said in the book of Jonah. And he was there three days and nights. Maybe pouting, I don't know. And he finally prayed and said, okay, I'll do what you want me to do, God. And, and immediately, immediately, the fish spewed him up onto, onto land. It doesn't say where, but it probably might have been the Mediterranean. It doesn't matter. Phoenicia and all these different places worship Dagon. And this guy's been in a fish for three days. He's probably bleached white, probably lost his hair, because that's what stomach acid does to people, and comes out of this giant fish onto shore. One of the people who are there, there's probably people on shore who saw him. Bible doesn't say it, but we're, we're troubles fast. We saw a giant fish. I mean, we saw the biggest fish I've ever seen. Keep this guy up on the land, and he's pure white. And he starts marching to Nineveh, and he goes and he preaches the worst sermon series ever. Probably on purpose, you know? <laughs> In 40 days, Nineveh's going to be overthrown. Overthrown. The Hebrew word is the same for what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah. It's a heavy-duty word. It means destroyed. And what the Ninevites do? That's a boring service. I don't believe this guy. No. They got afraid. They saw a guy who was completely bleached white, bald, and maybe perhaps word came that he got kicked out of a fish, and they worshiped Dagon, the fish god. They got scared. They repented. They fasted from food and water. Even their animal, even the puppy dogs fasted and <laughs> didn't drink water for three, for, for three days or whatever. And God relented. But Noah had a pity party. Now, obedience to God's word, even if you've been disobedient, will lead to blessing. Noah's, or Jonah's blessing, not Noah, Jonah's blessing, he's puked out of the well. He was... He was coughed up. He did what God wanted him to do. But Noah decided to have a pity party about it because he didn't think yeah, faith is trusting and obeying and trusting God and obeying. Um, he didn't think God's way was the right way. He, he trusted God's word and we can, you know, I, I can do that. I believe God's word, but as far as this sin that I want to do, I don't think it's right for God to tell me not to do it. Now, we may not think that. We may lie to ourselves. But if God says to do something, or if God says to not do something, to stop doing something, true faith is going to, going to either do it or not do it, depending on what the Word of God says. And so, believing God and obeying is true faith. A lot of churches are saying you can believe God, but live your life however you want, and then come and repent because God's grace is ishy squishy and gooey chewy and all that. But no, God's grace depends upon if you repent and turn to God wholeheartedly. That's one of those things that's really difficult for a lot of people. That God wants us to live a holy life according to his word. 
Or if God calls us to some pe person that we don't like. Some person whose sins are worse than mine. God sees us all the same. He saw the Ninevites the same as he saw the Jews. And, and Jonah didn't get that. Jonah thought he knew best with God. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. God knows what he's doing. When he, when he gives us his word, it's pure, it's holy. Every, every bit of it's correct. But it's active, it's living, it's sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts down to the quick. But sometimes, and this is what my old pastor, Stanford Williams, said, sometimes knowing God's word is a lot different than taking that long, long journey down to the heart to actually believing it, trusting it, living it, standing on it, walking in it. So walk in the, walk in the Lord's word. Know God's word. As Christians, we, we should know God's word. We should have a, a reason to give to others for the hope that we have. Let's see. Now Jonah, even though he was disobedient, even though, you know, some of us think, hey, I'm too old, or I've been holding off on the call of God in my life. Doesn't matter. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. God's gifts and His calling. He's God. He knows exactly what we're going to do. He's got everything planned out. He knows when we're going to accept Him. He knows when we'll mature in Christ. And He knows what plan He has for us. Plans to prosper us and to give us a hope in the future. He also knows that He can work through our disobedience. Even though we shouldn't be disobedient, Jonah got swallowed by a whale. Jonah got spit out on the ocean by a fish. That gave a lot of weighty impact to his message. It's never too late to start that calling that God has in your life. It's never too late to do that. Now's the, now's the hour. If you if the Lord's telling you to do something or to not do something, now's the time to either stop it or to do it. All right, I'm going to skip a bit. Think about that. <laughs> I've been trying to wrap my head about being in a fish. You know, I couldn't imagine that. That fish was prepared for Jonah, though. And we got our own issues, our own situations prepared for us. Through faith, we'll get through it. Through trusting God, we'll get through it. All right, our next, our next point on this is obedience in the storm. What if you're walking along, the Lord tells you to do something and you're doing it, or you're not, you're not sinning, you're living, you know, because every time the storm hits me, I make, a, I make a mental check, am I in sin, God? Am I in sin? Is there something I need to repent from? Well, what about when you are walking with the Lord and the storm comes not because of your disobedience, in uh, Matthew 14, 22 through 36, this is after Jesus fed 5,000 people with a kid's happy meal, a few fish and a few loaves. That's amazing in and of itself. That's a big victory. Wouldn't that build your faith? You know, wouldn't that build your faith? Oh my goodness, I've heard, I've heard of a, a pastor say that he went down to, uh, I think it was South or Central America, and there was a guy down there who did that. There was a bunch of kids, poor kids, didn't even have shoes, and he had just one bag of M&Ms. And he got a little bit out in a cup, gave it to the kids, and they knew they didn't have much, but they prayed to the Lord and gave thanks for it. And, they, and the, and the M&Ms kept flowing, this guy said. And this is a pastor I trust. This isn't some Flemingite type of crazy you know, person that I wouldn't trust. It's a guy I've trusted for over a decade as a pastor. 
and he said he couldn't believe his eyes. This guy who was doing a kid's puppet show and evangelizing children in this poor Hispanic town kept scooping out M&Ms. And the kids would get their M&Ms, who would turn around and, and go back in line multiple times. And he knew they were doing it. God knew they were doing it. The M&Ms kept coming. And there was a ton of kids, and they, they all got more than they needed. Amen. And, and, you know, God is like that. God, God cares about us, right down to our, our stomachs and, and us being taken care of. He cared about those little kids who don't have anything, not even shoes, to bless them with m and over and over miraculously. I just thought that was great. But immediately, Jesus, now this is Jesus after feeding 5,000 5, men, not including the mothers and children. Immediately, J Jesus made the disciples go into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. So he made his disciples get in the boat, go to the other side. That was his command. Later that night, he was alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So God said, go. This time the devil said no, probably. We don't know. We don't know what caused the storm, but the disciples were told to go to the other side and something was stopping them from even moving an inch forward. But they kept rowing. And oftentimes that's that's the devil. If it isn't me causing the problem, and if the Lord's told me to go to the other side and wants me to go to the other side, and you hit a storm, you hit a trial in your life that you feel like I've been rolling against this for so long and it's not the Lord and it's not my sin and I'm getting tired and getting fatigued. I don't know, I don't know if I can hold out much longer. You gotta hold out. You gotta hold out longer and wait on the Lord. Test of faith. They come right after a great victory. When when you're when you're, I just remember, like, witnessing to the Lord and having someone accept Jesus, and then, boom, test it. Boom, test it. This church is going to have some victories coming up this year, I believe. We're having a victory right now. The Word of God's going out. It's going out through the Internet. It's going out through into our ears. And God is preparing us for something big. But you know what? We almost seem like we're stalled a little bit, don't we? Like we're rowing against the wind, but we know what God's told us. Don't give up. Keep rowing. Wait on the Lord. Those that wait on the Lord shall stop rowing and go back to the other shore, right? No. We're gonna renew our we're gonna renew our strength. We're gonna mount up with wings like eagles. We're gonna walk and not grow weary. We're gonna run and not be faint. And why do we do that? Let's get through this. So the results are fatigue, doubt, unbelief. Let me get to this part. Jesus came to them. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. It's easy to glance over that. I was trying to get out of a river when I broke my foot. Gravity made me slip. My foot went in between two rocks and boom, fifth metatarsal on my left foot cracked. Jesus didn't have that trouble. He was walking on the water, you know? I could have walked on water if I could do that all the way to shore and never broke my foot. But Jesus walked on water, coming out to them. He's, you know, Jesus does things that we just don't accept or believe at the time. There's something called cognitive dissonance. I believe I'm saying that right. You, you had counseling, right? That sounds correct. Yeah. That's where when you see an event that doesn't make sense to your reality, the way you think reality is, is you think this is not right, and you come up with an explanation that fits your worldview. They said when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, 
They were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Look for Jesus to come into your situation, into your trial. Some trials, like Joseph's, go on for years until the Lord shows up. Don't give up hope. Don't give up looking. Don't give up waiting. Don't give up roaming either. Don't go backwards. Wait on the Lord to step into your situation. And Jesus came walking on water. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Now, Peter, as a pastor, I'm a little afraid of putting people down in the Bible, you know, because then I think about my own life and I think about my own stinking thinking and all that, like Mike says, and all the things I've done. Peter had his issues, like we all do. No, I don't see any of the other disciples saying, Lord, if it's you, I'm going to disbelieve my cognitive dissonance. If it's you, tell me to come. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat. We'll get to that. Peter got out of the boat. We know the story. He's looking at the Lord, and then it's like, there's winds and waves. I'm walking on water. Oh, my gosh, there's winds and waves. He started to sink. And, and he started to sink. And he gave the shortest prayer you ever, ever hear. I think in the Greek it might be one word. He said, Lord, save. Save me. And Jesus reached out his hand and pulled him back up above the waves. We can do that at any time. If you start to feel like you're sinking, like at one point you're walking above it, but you're sinking, you can call on the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Think about that. You're saved, you're looking down. You have no strength left. You're worried about the storm and such. And he, he, he's not, Jesus didn't say, Sam, I don't care. He reached out and he, he pulled him back up. So he, won't, he won't break a bruised reed. He won't snuff out a smoldering wick. He, he, he ministers to us right where our faith is. Augustine, St. Augustine said, he came walking on the waves. Let me read it here because I'm kind of blind. He came walking on the waves, and so he put all the swelling storms of life under his feet, Christians. Why be afraid? Jesus, I mean, you might ask, why am I in this trial? I don't know, but God's going to show you someday if you keep running, if you keep waiting. But Jesus is there. He came walking on the water to show, I'm above the storms. One point, he rebuked the storm and it went away. Sometimes God doesn't do that. Sometimes God lets us go through that, the waves and the wind and the rowing, so we can realize Jesus is above the storm. He walks above it, and we can walk with him above it too. If we just have faith, step out of the boat. If you're going through an extended season of trials, if you feel your strength is ebbing and buckling under the pressure, if you have at one time heeded the master's call to walk above it all, but somehow you shifted your eyes and your focus on the waves instead of the maker of all things, if you feel your legs are starting to sink and your feet are getting wet in the waters of despair, turn your eyes back on the Savior's wonderful face. Grab his hand. Let him pull you out of it and walk with him again over, over the situation. Keep your eyes, your life's focus on Jesus. There's many ways to do that. What's one way, Mike? Pastor Mike? Mm -hmm. Word of God. Yeah, hey, I get that. I get that. The word of God. Here it is. <laughs> word of God. Stay in the Word of God. And, and you know what I do? I ask God. I got. I got into the read through the Bible in a year deal, which is great. Read through the Bible in a year on your phone. And my phone will say, ding, ding, time to read, Roger. Time to read. And, I, I you know, they all kind of, after a while, they have you read a little bit out of the old and 
some out of the new. And after a while, I was like, I only read so much or I can't read so little and focus on so little. It is a, a conveyor belt, but it's good to get that word of God in your heart. And if you, if you have trouble reading, push the play button. The Bible app, push the play button and some real fancy sounding dude with a British accent or whatever is going to read the Bible to you and you can hear the word of God. So, I mean, there's no excuses for us on the word of God. What else? Pastor Phil, what else helps us? Prayer. Prayer. Oh, you're reading off my list here. Prayer. No, no, it's simple. There's no new, nothing new under the sun for Christians. Reading the Bible and prayer. What's a third thing? Uh, anybody, can, can you think of a third thing that helps you when you're going through a trial to stay near the Lord? Worship. worship. Yeah, worship. Is there another thing? Obedience. Yeah, obedience. We're doing it right now, though. Believe you. Fellowship, yeah. <laughs> We're doing it right now. Stay in fellowship. Don't forsake the assembling together at some of the habit of doing. You can shipwreck your faith. So keep your life's focus on the Lord. Prayer, Bible study, fellowship with solid believers. We're going to do that tonight at 6. Through Zoom. We're going, to have, we're going to fellowship and pray together. And you can pour out your requests before the Lord and we can agree with you in prayer. Where two or more are gathered, there he is. So sometimes our obedience to God's word brings us into a, a quick, intense trial. Something I like to call fiery trials. I hate those. <laughs> I think I hate the extended ones. You know, I'd rather get something over with quickly. Extended trials might be the worst in my, my judgment. But we all know Jan Daniel 3. So I call this obedience in the fire. We know where it's going. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We know what happened. Chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. God brought Daniel. Daniel told him the dream. It was a big statue. The gold head, the silver arms and, and chest, and the, the thighs of bronze, and then iron legs, and then partially iron, partially clay feet. And Nebuchadnezzar, it just went over his head, maybe. I don't know. I don't know why. But Nebuchadnezzar got a wild craving to build a 90-foot tall gold statue. And then force everybody when the when the music played, you gotta bow down and worship this thing I made with my hands. Or had people. He had. He has people. Nebuchadnezzar had people to do that for him. So Nebuchadnezzar tried to get people to uh, bow down to a big hunk of metal and worship it. What happened? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego happened. What what did they do? Well, they remembered God's word. Mm -hmm. They remembered that in Exodus 20, verse 3, God said, and we just studied this, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. They remembered Pardon me. They remembered God's word. Actually, Israel and Judah. Judah was exiled because they kept bowing down to Baal and Ashtoreth and worshiping other gods and provoking God to jealous anger. And over centuries, God warned them. He warned them. And then, boom, it happened. Nebuchadnezzar came in, 586 BC, and took everybody, including Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego away. Corporate sin affects the individual. Corporate sin affects me. And they realized that. And they realized that's what he's trying to make us do. We're not going to do it. We've already been beaten up by God for this as a nation. They refused to. Nebuchadnezzar said, I'll give you one more chance. They said, it doesn't matter if you, if you throw us in the fire and if we die. Even though our God's able to save us, we're not going to bow down to that thing. So he said, stoke up the fire seven times harder. 
They bound, they had, he had people bound, he, Nebuchadnezzar had people to bound other people, you know, he had people. And they bound Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and tossed them in the fire. And guess what happened to those guys who tossed them in the fire? They died. Boom, he stroked death. Boom, they died. It was that hot. But Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they were still in there and alive. There's that. There's the. There's them not bowing down. But then there's them in the fire. And these are just pictures I I, I swiped off of uh, Google images, of course. You see, Nebuchadnezzar looked in, and he saw that they were all standing, and they weren't bound anymore. The trial burnt their their bounds off, the bindings, their ropes, or whatever tied them up and kept them from being mobile. But Nebuchadnezzar being the king of Babylon, actually was really good at counting. You know, like the count from Sesame Street. He goes, one, two, three, four people. Ah, ah, ah. And he's like, four people? And one looks like the son of God. Or he said the son of God. And then he bid them to come out. And then he changed his tune about the God of heaven and earth, Yahweh. And he made an edict. That everybody who says anything about the, this God bad, they're going to be impaled on a, pay, on a pole, their house torn into pieces of rubble. He's a pretty impetuous guy, really. I mean, that's, but you know what? He changed his tune about that. And I doubt that he uh, made people worship that fiery image. Jesus sits, stands with you in the fiery trial, he's with you in every trial. He's very close, I think, when we go through fiery trials. What we're looking at is, let me skip ahead. Basically, what we're looking at is persecution. I, 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 I'm like Mike. I, in fact, I've gone, I've gone since the election, I've just like took it a fast from, from the news. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know about it. Everything's political all the time on the news. I don't want to hear it. You know, election years are trials. Let's let's face it. An election year in and of itself, let alone in 2020, is a trial. But you know what? Maybe God's gonna make our focus on the Lord, hopefully, after the last year more. Because maybe, maybe things are gearing up toward the church is gonna be going through persecution. I really believe the tribulation is around the corner. Um, Jerusalem has been declared their capital. That's a step toward a temple. And the Jews have everything needed, maybe with the exception of the Ark of the Covenant for temple worship. They're all ready to go. They can set it up in 45 minutes, I heard, from sources. But there's going to be another temple. And the Antichrist is going to walk in halfway through the tribulation. And he's going to set himself up as God above everything that calls itself a God or a deity of any kind. It's going to go from Chrislam, coexist religion, all religions get together in some sort of hippie hoedown, I guess, I don't know, to he's going to abolish that. And he's going to say, y'all worship me now. Because the spirit of Satan's in his heart. <clears throat> But, the, but between now and then, the church, I believe, is going to hit more and more persecution. We've been sheltered in this country. But church, brace yourself. Times are going to change. Brace yourself. Know God's word. Know what he says. So when someone tells you to, to disobey it or to break it, you can say no. And stay near the Lord. Because that the Holy Spirit gives us the power to be able to go through persecution. And one last thing, the, the, I think it was Tertullian said that, that the blood of the saints is the seed of the church. And the church ain't doing so well in this country. So who knows what God's intentions are. It's not to harm us, but he does need to revitalize this church. And persecution causes the church to grow and, to, and to people to deepen. But I just wanted to end this with this last part. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. 
But now, this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who created you, Israel. There's actually two different words for created there. The first created in Hebrew means like taking a piece, taking a raw log and carving out a rough form out of it. The other one's more of a polished, you know, like let's let's give it a good fine shape that and to find a better definition. Jacob, whenever God talks about Jacob, it's it's some it's when Jacob was being disobedient, it means heel catcher. But after Jacob wrestled with God, his name was Israel. That means he wrestled with God and won and he became obedient. He didn't live by faith before, but he lived by faith later in his life, but he had to live because of it. Because he because that angel touched the socket of his hip. Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Isn't that good? To be the Lord's. Even if we've got some bruises and cuts along the way, it's good to be the Lord's. When you pass, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not even set you ablaze. God's promises, and you can, you can stand on them when you go through trials of any kinds, whether they're watery, windy, terrible trials, you feel like they're never going to end, or whether they're a quick, intense trial. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. He's going to make your path straight. He's going to take care of you. So let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you that you never leave nor forsake us. I thank you, God, that all the promises in your book, this book right here, are yea and amen. Yes, and it will happen. Lord, help, God, help us to put those promises in our heart and obey them. And Lord, help us not to shrink back when we go through a trial. If there's anything in our hearts, Lord, that's hindering your work and your word from fulfilling your purposes in our lives, may we repent right here, right now. Turn it 180 degrees and go and, and do or stop doing what you want us to do. Give us strength through the, the long extended trials. And Lord, help us to be found worthy of you and to overcome should we go through the persecution that's already hit in the whole world. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.